Hello everyone, I'm Miss Lacan, your librarian, and today's story is The Vast Wonder of the World, about biologist Ernest Everett Jest, written by Melina Mango. Woods Hole, Massachusetts, 1911. At twilight, a man lay on a dock, luring marine worms with a lantern. He scooped them out with his net and placed them in a bucket. He couldn't wait to look at them more closely. He knew the ways of the sea, though he was not a fisherman. His grandfather had built wharfs, but he was not a dock worker. His name was Ernest Everett Just, and he was a scientist. Ernest was not like other scientists. He saw the whole, where others only saw parts. He noticed details others failed to see. On the dock at dawn, he wrote poetry. Back in his laboratory, Ernest examined the marine worms under the microscope. He recorded and sketched their movements. How did their tiny egg cells create new life, he wondered. At a time when few expected a black man to do so well, Ernest became the world authority on how life begins from an egg. From early on, Ernest wondered about the world of water around him. Born in Charleston, South Carolina, where rivers and oceans meet, Ernest watched how fishermen netted their catch. He learned how to read from his school teacher mother. After his father died when he was four, he learned how hard life could be. To find better paying work, Ernest's mother moved their family from the city across the river to the country. Soon after, Ernest caught typhoid fever. He survived, but he had lost the ability to read. He cried alone, struggling to relearn it all. Then, one day, a miracle. Ernest could read again. He read as often as he could, letting his imagination roam, and words came to life as magical spirits. Ernest attended the school his mother created in the town that she had established. Ernest's mother never stopped working. Ernest never stopped observing, even while cooking, cleaning, and watching his younger brother and sister. He observed how a hurricane damaged their school, how tougher segregation laws restricted African Americans, and how his mother's remarriage changed life at home. What Ernest really loved to observe, though, was nature. Surrounded by rivers and ocean, marsh and mud, he found plenty to explore. At 13, Ernest left home to attend boarding school in Orangeburg, South Carolina. It was here he published his first poem. When he graduated, Ernest returned home, hoping to begin teaching in his mother's school. But, unfortunately, a fire had destroyed it. Ernest left the segregated South on a steamship to continue his education up north. He dove into his new classes at a college preparatory school in New Hampshire. While he was away, his mother fell ill with tuberculosis and died. Ernest was stunned. Full of grief and confusion, Ernest did the only thing he knew to do, return to his studies. He went on to Dartmouth College, working to pay his own way and to support his brother and sister back home. With less time to study, Ernest failed a class. He thought of his family and how they depended on him. He thought of his mother's hard work and belief in education. He had to keep going. Ernest took a biology class and his life changed forever. In that class, he discovered the microscopic world of the cell. Scientists knew that the cell is the smallest building block of life, but many had only a basic understanding of how the different parts of a cell work together as new life developed. Ernest wanted to unlock this mystery. And he did. Ernest became a biology professor at Howard University in Washington, D.C., teaching students to question and observe. Each summer, he traveled to the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, to research and experiment. Out on the collecting boat, Ernest looked for sea urchins, sand dollars, starfish, and marine worms. He then carefully transported them to the lab in a covered bucket so the beating sun would not damage them. Most scientists carelessly removed sea animals to study, but Ernest demonstrated that by observing living things in as natural as an environment as possible, they could learn more. Ernest also taught scientists how to thoroughly cleanse glassware and equipment for the most accurate experiments. Using a simple light microscope, Ernest examined the egg cells of all those sea animals, night after night, 
day after day. And while observing sand dollar eggs, Ernest noticed a wave of movement when a sperm contacted the egg. As slight as a shiver, it signaled an amazing discovery. The egg cell directed its own development during fertilization. And this controversial idea went against what most scientists thought at the time. It wasn't just the sperm creating changes. The cell surface and the layer right below it were just as important in generating new life. Ernest published his research findings in many scientific papers. He traveled to conferences to share his ideas, and he won the first NAACP Springer Medal. As his reputation grew, Ernest's ideas caught the attention of scientists around the world. He was the first American research scientist invited to the world-famous Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, Germany. From then on, Ernest worked in Europe as often and as long as he could, enjoying more warmth and respect than he'd ever felt in America. Despite his accomplishments, Ernest felt increasingly stifled in the United States. His family was not welcome with him in Massachusetts because of the color of their skin, and he struggled with basic laboratory equipment at Howard. He didn't have the freedom white scientists had to choose where they worked, and the time came when Ernest refused to tolerate the segregation any longer. He decided to move to France and become an independent researcher. Crossing the Atlantic, Ernest thought about the hundreds of students he introduced to science and how his fascination with cells began. He poured those memories and feelings into his work and completed a groundbreaking book. Through his careful observations and hard work, Ernest opened up the wonder of the universe to all of us through a tiny egg cell.